Good afternoon, everyone. It is time for us to gather together. In fact, it's past time. It's been an interesting afternoon. Uh, we were originally scheduled to go live at five o'clock. And uh, at five o'clock, I was still trying to get out of West Knoxville. Was able to get on long enough to be able to post an update, uh, post a notice that we were postponing until six o'clock. So I hope that that didn't inconvenience anyone. But, you know, um, I can only <laughs> do so much. My teleporter is not working today. In any case, glad we could gather here in this uh, venue. Uh, informal kind of, of, of setting, you know, a little more home-like. But um, whatever the setting, we are going to dig into a significant day today. Uh, let's give a little context before we get started here. We're going to be reading from Acts chapter 2 and uh, verses 1 through 21. As you saw on our graphic, as you were coming in, Acts 2, 1 through 21. And a lot of you will recognize that as being the passage that tells us about the day of Pentecost. Uh, happy birthday, church. Okay, birthday of the church, celebrating that momentous event. It's in the book of Acts, which is sort of volume two of Dr. Luke's telling to Theophilus of the history of the early church. The book of Luke which is uh, volume one about Jesus, the biography of Jesus. And so uh, the book of Acts, whole book, is about the early days of the church. And so in Acts chapter two, uh, I want you to try to imagine being Theophilus, reading this for the first time. You may have read it multiple times in your lifetime. But think about when you get a letter from a loved one, maybe that you have not talked with in a long time, you open it quickly, you read it eagerly, you're interested to see what has happened. You don't already know the contents of the letter. Try to imagine reading this amazing story for the first time. It says, when Pentecost Day arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? And just for comparison, think about somebody hearing something like this and saying, Aren't all these people just East Tennesseans? They're just country folk like us. How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the regions of Libya bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this. Listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suspect. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my servants, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness and the moon will be changed into blood before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now just imagine reading that for the first time. If you had received this letter from Luke, if you were Theophilus, and although this happened nearly 2,000 years ago, 
I think there's some stuff here that we can dig into and apply today. Think about our lives today. I, one of the things that I think about when I think about the language thing that's involved here, it reminds me of when I was in college, which is many years ago, that was the mid 1970s. I was privileged to be part of a choral group at my college. We toured seven countries in six weeks. So this was not just a fun vacation. This was a working trip. We sang somewhere every day. Uh, sometimes we sang twice a day. And uh, I do remember being in Germany and accidentally locking my hotel room key in the room. Went downstairs to the front desk. Uh, the desk clerk, who obviously was German, didn't speak English. I didn't speak any German. I had a difficult time getting him to understand what the problem was. Eventually, we figured out that each of us knew a little bit of Spanish. Now, back then, I could remember the Spanish word for key. Uh, I, I couldn't do it now if my life depended on it. But back then, I had that little bit. It was enough for me to get across to him what the problem was. Language remains a challenge today. Language has always been a part of the separation of people from each other. Now, our usual assumption is that language is developed because people were scattered different parts of the world. Uh, I've, I've been told there's over a hundred languages in the uh, Indian subcontinent. Uh, you can't drive 12 hours in Europe without crossing at least six languages unlike here in the United States. But sometimes we think here in this country, because we all speak English, and of course not everybody does, but most of us do, but we might assume that the English that we speak in New Hampshire, let's say, is the same as the English we speak in Georgia, and therefore we will understand each other. That in itself can be a barrier. Genesis chapter 11 says that it's the opposite. That is, we scattered across the earth because God caused us to have different languages. Whichever one came first, uh, it is certain that the world is characterized by separation, by division, by confusion. In fact, that Genesis 11 story you will recognize as being the story of the Tower of Babel. And Babel itself means confusion. And so whatever happened in Genesis 11, it, it shows us about how humans, depending on themselves, leaving God behind, wind up in a state of confusion. So whatever else happened on the day of Pentecost, I think we can see that Pentecost was the reversal of Babel. Instead of language that divided us, we had language that brought us together. Each heard in their own language. Now, whether or not speaking in tongues is something that comes today from the Holy Spirit, and that's not even what we're talking about here. That's certainly not what we're seeing in Acts chapter 2. Today, our concern is not whether the Spirit will enable us to speak in a tongue that no one except God can understand. It is whether we will allow the Spirit to enable us to speak in such a way that all who hear us understand. That's what was going on in Acts chapter 2. So it occurs to me that by applying those lessons today, there are some concerns for us to address. First of all, we need to be willing to speak. The Spirit empowered Peter and the other apostles, the eleven. But they had to be willing to speak in order for that ability to make an impact. Are we willing to speak to people who are not already inside the church? We must be willing to speak. We must seek to understand others. Remember that in Acts 2, each understood in their own language. It was not that they were required to first learn Hebrew. So we must seek to go to where people are to help them to understand. We must be willing to be uncomfortable as we're doing that. 
What I mean by that these days, uh, sometimes I will hear folks say, well, I, I don't want to do this Internet thing. Um, you know, I'm not comfortable with it. Let's just go back to the church building like we've done all of our lives. There are a lot of folks out there, some of you may be listening right now, who are uncomfortable going in a church building. And this technology right here can allow us to serve a hurting world. We're not trying to push our agenda on anybody. We're trying to help. And we must be willing to be uncomfortable in going outside of our usual. In fact, looking at that a little different way, do you notice in Acts chapter 2, we see some incredible diversity that is being displayed there? There was no message that we must all become alike. You have to dress a certain way. You have to talk a certain way. You have to speak in a certain language. There was unity in the diversity. Simply the unity that came from the message of Jesus Christ. As we look around in our churches, do we just see people who are like ourselves? That's not what was happening in Acts chapter 2. Something else that I see when I look there, and it comes from my background as a communication professional, there is a phrase that is known among communication professionals, and that is connection before content. Now, that does not mean that the content is unimportant. And certainly when we're talking about this message, that's not what it means. After all, the content is the good news of Jesus Christ. You better believe that is important content. The phrase connection before content simply means that without the connection, the content will not make an impact. As we look through especially the book of Acts, we see it right here in Acts chapter 2, but we also see in, let's say, Acts chapter 8, the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. We'll just pick a couple of verses out of there, uh, verses 30 and 31. It says, running up to the carriage, Philip heard the man reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you really understand what you are reading? The man replied, without someone to guide me, how could I? Then he invited Philip to climb up and sit with him. That personal connection was so important to helping the Ethiopian eunuch understand what he was reading. The gospel has always been transmitted person to person. And whether that is literally sitting face to face with somebody or connecting perhaps over the internet, person to person, connection before content. We see it again when the apostle Peter was sent to the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10 tells that story. And perhaps you know it as the uh, uh, Cornelius, the centurion. Verse 22 of Acts 10 says, We've come on behalf of Cornelius, a centurion and righteous man, a God worshiper who is well respected by all Jewish people. A holy angel directed him to summon you to his house and to hear what you have to say. There we are once again with the personal connection. Connection before content. We can't depend on the content just finding its way to the people who need it. We need to be inviting. We need to be connecting. Are we willing to do that? Most of us have heard the phrase from Scripture, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We're going to adapt that a little bit based on Acts chapter 2. And what we see there is that the spirit is willing. Are we? Are we willing to speak? Are we willing to be uncomfortable? Are we willing to reach out to those who are different from ourselves? We've been given the language to speak. The question is, are we going to use it? As we get ready to wrap up today, want to encourage you, if you are not already on our newsletter list, whether it is through Lincoln Park or Linwood, you may have some connection in the neighborhood there, but for either one of them, we publish an electronic newsletter, and we would love to be able to share that with you. Uh, you may see going across the bottom of your screen right now, the web address where you can go and um, uh, sign up for that newsletter. 
we're not going to spam you or anything, but this is a great way for us to share what's going on with the community to help connect you into the community. So we encourage you to go to lincolnparkmethodist.org slash newsletter, and you'll be able to get this weekly update of the news. We hope you will take advantage of that. We would look forward to seeing you in our sanctuary at Lincoln Park United Methodist Church or Linwood United Methodist Church or here on Facebook or on YouTube. This will be on YouTube also. We, we have a sermon by phone where you can get an audio version. There's also SoundCloud. We have lots of ways that you can connect with these two communities. But in any case, we hope that you will give us the opportunity to help in a hurting world. Go now in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>